uh, a community of faith that is able to bring glory to God at this time with this place. Uh, Jim has an announcement, and then I have a thought, and then we'll begin worship. Good morning. Uh, the session has been um, prayerfully considering uh, asking members of the church to be on the transition team. Remember, the transition team is the group of people that will help lead this congregation through the transition process. It is not the pastor search committee. That's later. And we're looking for five to seven people um, meet two or three times a month, depending on the activity. We'll be, one of the first things we'll be doing is um, looking at session minutes. I'm reading, there it is, thank you very much. I'm reading, I went back to 1990 because Gary Weston started in 1993. And it's interesting, I'm at 2004 now, or 2010, I forget. Anyhow, conversations with the members, Perhaps a few, uh, one fellowship event for table talk, some surveys, and then we prepare a self-study which talks about Valencia Presbyterian Church. Positives, negatives, the demographics of the congregation, aspects of the community, successes, challenges, opportunities, and the type of pastor we are looking for. We thank God we, the type of pastor we're looking for. And then what happens is they turn the self-study over to the pastor nominating committee who prepares the, it's now called a ministry discernment profile. When Gary came, it was a church information form. Um, and probably when Jim came, it was a church information form. Like, I'm not a veteran, but it's like being in the military. Then they changed it to a ministry information form, MIF. And now it's a... MDP, I think, MDM. Anyhow, we're looking for a broad range of ages. How do I say this? Uh, we're looking, uh, we, we've got a, a few, we've got I think three people have said yes. I still have to make another phone call, two phone calls. And um, we'd like to include someone who's older than me. How do I say that? I'm, I'm 71 years old, so it's not like, oh my gosh, but it's, it's uh, interesting that all the folks who have volunteered are younger than me, which is great. On the other hand, um, all voices need to be heard, and if you decide it's just not going to work for me, we will still make sure that all voices will be heard, regardless. Uh, it's not just five or six people making all the decisions. We'll be, we'll be engaging. Um, so pray about it, think about it, talk to me or Tom if you're interested, talk to Aaron, another session member, and uh, we'll get moving. Thank you very much. And one thing we will do at least on a monthly basis, and it's in this week's, this month's, this quarter's link, is keep you informed on a regular basis of the progress that we're making. Okay, but don't worry about cleaning the manse for the new pastor yet. It may not happen for a while. Thanks. I was, am I on? No? I got a green light. No, I don't. No, I do. Oh, there we go. <laughs> I was. Good morning. I was, uh, as, I, as I often do, I got up this morning and I went outside and was sitting on, out on the, on the back patio, which is a quiet area that's underneath a lot of oak trees and it gives me a chance to think and to respect the nature that's around me and to wrap my head around what I was thinking about saying today. And as I was sitting there with my cup of coffee, there was suddenly a, a, a kerplop and a splash and I was, uh, Shocked to see that a, an acorn had mysteriously fallen out of the tree and landed right in my coffee. <laughs> so I considered the acorn for a minute and fished it out and looked at it, and I was about to throw it away, and I thought to myself, no, 
that's an interesting acorn. It's, it's, you know, there's a story in scripture about the seeds falling in good places and seeds falling in rocky places and seeds falling in amongst the weeds and the thorns. And I wondered if, if scripture had anything to say about it falling into a coffee cup. <laughs> Obviously not. But as I thought about it some more, I thought, well, this is a special acorn. This is something here that's interesting. Come on, have a seat. You're allowed. So I was uh, reflecting on, on all of God's gifts and, and this little acorn, and I thought, well, little acorn, you're kind of special. So it's a little early for acorns. This one's a little bit green, whether it's ripened enough to actually germinate or not. I don't know, but we're going to try. I'm going to take this one home, and I'm going to plant it in good soil, and we'll see as time passes whether this little acorn will grow into something interesting. Perhaps the uh, caffeine in the coffee has supercharged it. <laughs> time will tell. It was an interesting thought. And as I was preparing to come this morning, I was thinking of the joy of, of new birth of this acorn which was falling and it was going to land someplace rocky because it's a paved area, but instead it fell into my hands. It has a second chance. So today, as we come to worship God, as we come to be together in his presence, let us know that we all have a second chance. Let us know that today, is a day that the Lord hath made. Come together, let us rejoice and be glad in it. Good morning. Good morning. Our call to worship. Gather before God, people of the covenant. Listen for God's word, O faithful ones. God has summoned us to this place. We believe God will speak to us here. Come to honor God and give thanks. Seek to learn and follow in God's way. God calls us as workers for justice. God sends us out as advocates for the disposed. Please join me in singing our opening hymn as we stand together if able.
Although we believe and trust in God, we have forgotten the covenant which God made with our ancestors and sinned. However, God shows the mercy promised to our ancestors and remembers this holy covenant, giving us the knowledge of salvation by the forgiveness of our sins. By the tender mercy of our God, the dawn will break upon us, shining into the darkness and the shadow of death, guiding our feet into the way of peace. Peace be with you. Take a moment to share this peace with those around you. call to confession. Is this another solemn assembly of people who are quite content with ourselves and unable to confront our hidden sin? Do we live in self-protective rebellion against God's call to rescue the oppressed and devote ourselves to seeking justice for all? Have we become a burden to God? Almighty God. Almighty God. We confess that we have shaped our own standards and values rather than seeking to know your will. We turn from faith in you and rebel against the agenda of your realm. Our hearts focus on the things we can accumulate more than on your mission in which we can share. Lead us, O God, into acts of compassion that our attitudes may be reshaped and a right relationship with you restored. Amen. (laughs) Yeah, we we tend to rush ahead with things. We tend to think about how the next step takes place. We tend to think Well, God, thank you very much. Get over there, because i got busy things to do. But yet, as we come before him with contrite hearts, as we come before him seeking to have him cleanse us from the rushing that we do and the sort of me-first stuff, he hears us. And as in the silence of our confession and the silence of our our world around us, we think, how great thou art, and what a blessing you have been for us. Those moments are precious and few, they should be often and many, but as we approach him with a contrite heart, he knows our hearts, he knows our feelings, he knows our sense of longing to be with him. And he has said, yes, I want you to be with me as much as you want to be with me. So he sent a son. He sent a son that would walk with us, who would talk with us, who would show us what perfection truly is. And at the end of his days, he took upon himself the sins of the world and stripped us clean. All we need do is say, Jesus, you are our Lord, and I have faith in you as our Savior. And he says, come unto me. Know that it is through your faith in Jesus Christ as your Lord and as your Savior that I can proclaim to you today that your sins indeed are forgiven. Amen and amen.
prayer for illumination. God, source of all light, by your word you give light to the soul. Pour out on us the spirit of wisdom and understanding that our hearts and minds may be opened. Amen. Our first scripture reading today is from John 11, 1 through 35. Now a man named Lazarus was sick. He was from Bethany, the village of Mary and her sister Martha. This Mary, whose brother Lazarus now lay sick, was the same one who poured perfume on the Lord and wiped his feet with her hair. So the sister sent word to Jesus, Lord, the one you love is sick. When he heard this, Jesus said, this sickness will not end in death. No, it is for God's glory so that God's son may be glorified through it. Now Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. So when he heard that Lazarus was sick, he stayed where he was two more days. And then he said to his disciples, let us go back to Judea. But Rabbi, they said, a short while ago, the Jews there tried to stone you, and yet you are going back? Jesus answered, are there not 12 hours of daylight? Anyone who walks in the daytime will not stumble, for they see by this world's light. It is when a person walks at night that they stumble, for they have no light. After he had said this, he went on to tell them, our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep, but I am going there to wake him up. His disciples replied, Lord, if he sleeps, he will get better. Jesus had been speaking of his death, but his disciples thought he meant natural sleep. So then he told them plainly, Lazarus is dead, and for your sake I am glad I was not there, so that you may believe, but let us go to him. Then Thomas, also known as Didymus, said to the rest of the disciples, let us also go that we may die with him. On his arrival, Jesus found that Lazarus had already been in the tomb for four days. Now Bethany was less than two miles from Jerusalem, and many Jews had come to Martha and Mary to comfort them in the loss of their brother. When Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she went out to meet him, but Mary stayed at home. Lord, Martha said to Jesus, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. But I know that even now, God will give you whatever you ask. Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. Martha answered, I know he will rise again in the resurrection at the last day. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. The one who believes in me will live even though they die. And whoever lives by believing in me will never die. Do you believe this? Yes, Lord, she replied. I believe that you are the Messiah, the Son of God, who is to come into the world. After she had said this, she went back and called her sister Mary aside. The teacher is here, she said, and is asking for you. When Mary heard this, she got up quickly and went to him. Now Jesus had not yet entered the village, but was still at the place where Martha had met him. When the Jews who had been with Mary in the house comforting her noticed how quickly she got up and went out, they followed her, supposing she was going to the tomb to mourn there. When Mary reached the place where Jesus was and saw him, she fell at his feet and said, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. When Jesus saw her weeping and the Jews who had come along with her also weeping, he was deeply moved in spirit and troubled. Where have you laid him, he asked. Come and see, Lord, they replied. Jesus wept. Then the Jews said, see how he loved him. But some of them said, could not he who opened the eyes of the blind man have kept this man from dying? Jesus, once more deeply moved, came to the tomb. It was a cave with a stone across the entrance. Take away the stone, he said. But Lord, said Martha, the sister of the dead man, by this time there will be a bad odor, for he has been there four days. Then Jesus said, did I not tell you that if you believe, 
you will see the glory of God. So they took away the stone. Then Jesus looked up and said, Father, I thank you that you have heard me. I know that you always hear me. But I said this for the benefit of the people standing here, that they may believe that you sent me. When he had said this, Jesus called in a loud voice, Lazarus, come out! The dead man came out, his hands and feet wrapped with strips of linen and a cloth around his face. Jesus said to them, take off the grave clothes and let him go. Therefore, many of the Jews who had come to visit Mary and had seen what Jesus did believed in him. But some of them went to the Pharisees and told them what Jesus had done. Then the chief priests and the Pharisees called a meeting of the Sanhedrin. What are we accomplishing, they asked. Here is the man performing many signs. If we let him go on like this, everyone will believe in him. And then the Romans will come and take away both our temple and our nation. Then one of them, named Cephas, who was the high priest that year, spoke up, You know nothing at all. You do not realize that it is better for you that one man die for the people than the whole nation perish. He did not say this on his own, but as high priest that year, he prophesied that Jesus would die for the Jewish nation. And not only for that nation, but for all the scattered children of God, to bring them together and make them one. So from that day on, they plotted to take his life. May the Lord bless unto us this reading from his holy word, and unto him be all glory and all praise. And Father, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of our heart bring glory to you. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. This past week, we, we lost one of the saints, Nancy Shattuck, passed on to glory, and I was privileged to be a part of the service that uh, celebrated her life on Friday. And I was reflecting on her and her uh, ministry here, and she seemed to be all about the kids. She seemed to be all about making sure that the children were brought up to understand who God was and to, to appreciate the biblical story that we all have come to, to know. And it's important stuff, right? It's, you've got to make sure that the kids know, know the story and know how, how God unfolded his plan throughout the years. And I was reflecting on some of the past stories that I've heard about how children have learned, you know, about God. And the one that came to mind that sort of was interesting was the story of uh, a group of Sunday school teachers who had all of their young kids uh, together, you know, during the church hour, and they worked feverishly trying to get them to understand the Christmas story, the birth narrative. And they, 
worked all through the Advent season on bringing these kids up to speed on knowing how God had come into this world. And so the kids were <clears throat> enthusiastic and they learned and everything was fine. And after the Advent season was done, after the Christmas season was done, the, 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 the teachers asked all the children to, to draw pictures of what they thought was the best part of the Christmas story. So that all the children gathered and, and they drew their pictures with crayons and they did a wonderful job of it. And they decided, the teachers decided that really what they needed to do was to put all of the, the pictures up on the wall. So they did. And they asked the preacher to, you know, would you come and have a look at all of these wonderful pictures? So he, he came and he looked and he studied each picture as he was going around and he finally came to one and he stopped and he looked at it and he said, who, uh, who drew this one? And little Tommy put up his hand and says, I drew it, very excited. And the preacher says, well, what, what, uh, what's going on there? It looks like that's an airplane. And the little Tommy looks up and he says, yeah, that's the Holy Family's flight from Egypt. And a preacher said, well, I guess it's true, you know, they, they did have to flee for their lives and, and run, run to Egypt. So I, I'm not sure there was really a plane involved. <laughs> and little Tommy was a little disappointed, but he, he says, but it was a flight. He says, okay. He says, all right. He says, that's fine. He says, but now, he says, I have one more question. He says, I see the plane, and I see the people in the plane. I see baby Jesus. I see Mary. I see Joseph. I said, but who? Who's that third person? He goes, oh, that's Pontius the pilot. <laughs> Let's pray. Father, we want our children to understand your message clearly and concisely. We sometimes have led them to a point where they get the idea, but maybe they don't necessarily get all the details. So, Father, as we bring our children closer to you each time, may we know that it is important that we guide them and we strengthen them. And we do this through the love that you have shown into us. Father, lift them up as you have lifted us up and guide them and protect them, particularly, Father, in these next few weeks as they all go back to school, as they all start school, as they all are faced with new challenges, make sure that you are part of their lives. Make sure that we who are parents or teachers or, or grandparents or just role models in the neighborhood, make sure that each of us shows your love into their lives. Thank you, Father, for them. Thank you for our, our part in their lives. Christ's name we pray. Amen. One to the other, right? So, one of the read the reading that we did this morning is sort of the full story of Lazarus being risen. It's one of the longest stories in Scripture. And I broke it into two parts. Didn't do an Old Testament reading, but I thought, I thought it important that, that you hear the whole story from beginning to end. Because it's a, it's, a it's a great account. I don't, I, sometimes I call this a story, but it's not a story. It's an account of how Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead. As you were hearing the story, I'm sure not for the first time, have you ever put yourself into that story somewhere? Have you ever thought, well, maybe I could have been one of those people that was standing on the side. Maybe, maybe I was one of the ones who, was, who accompanied Mary and Martha to the grave. I was, maybe I was just one of the people that lived in the community that, that I was a witness to all of this. And, and how would you have responded to that? Whenever I've read accounts in scripture or 
some of the uh, parables, I've always tried to imagine myself as having been there in some way and having been able to, to view it uh, in a very unique, special way. Maybe, maybe you saw yourself as, as one of the uh, main characters. Maybe you were a Martha or a Mary. Maybe you were thinking to yourself, had my brother died, and had I known that Jesus was delaying coming, how would I have felt? You know, we don't know the tone which Martha and Mary used when they said, had you been but here, he would not have died. Was it a snarly tone, or was it a, a sad tone? Maybe that's something for you to think about. Maybe you're, maybe you're envisioning yourself as one of the disciples, Thomas, who's also known as the twin, and he had said to Jesus, well, if you're going, you know, you're putting yourself in extreme danger. I'm not sure why you're going, but we'll go with you because supposedly some people think I look like you. And so, you know, if anybody's going to take a bullet, let me step up and I'll do it. Hence the I'll die with you comment. Maybe you're thinking yourself as the man who, who said, you know nothing. Maybe you're the chief priest for the year thinking how Jesus, he's going to make a big splash and he's going to cause more trouble than it's worth for us and we should get rid of him. There's a lot of characters involved in this entire story. And you can think about each one in their role, and perhaps you could see yourself in, in some, some spot or other. And I would suggest to you that the main one that you should see yourself as is Lazarus. We, each of us, are Lazarus. We, each of us, have been given some opportunity to to respond to a second chance that we have been given in our lives because Jesus has stripped us of our sins. I told you last week that I was going to discuss two things in the first two weeks of my ministry with you. One was, what do I intend on preaching? Which last week was Jesus Christ and him crucified. And this week I wanted to tell you why I am here. What, what led me to being a pastor? I mean, obviously, I have a garden center. I have a business. I have a family. I'm fairly busy. <clears throat> so why am I here? Some years back, I was uh, privileged to go with the family down to the Caribbean in the middle of the winter. And we had a wonderful time. It was great. We frolicked. We swam. We walked. We hiked. We ate too much, maybe drank too much. But anyway, we had a wonderful time. And we came back <clears throat> in the middle of winter. It was January or <clears throat> February, I think. And we, uh, we were back. And, and I uh, was invited along with the family to my sister-in-law's house to have dinner. So we went and had a very nice dinner. And after the dinner, we came back. And uh, I started feeling a little off. And I thought, well, you know, maybe I got a stomach ache. Maybe it was something I ate. So I, as the evening wore on, I started to feel a little worse. And I thought, well, you know, maybe I'm getting the flu. This was just a stomach ache. So I thought, ugh, I'm going to bed. So I went in and climbed into bed. And I laid there for a few minutes. I don't know how long. And it just, it just wasn't something, I don't know. I got up. I got up. Something encouraged me to get up. So I got up and I came out and uh, Liz said, huh? And I said, you know, Liz, I said, maybe I should go to the hospital. And she immediately started bouncing off the ceiling and, and uh, the rest of it. And she was running around trying to get ready to go. And I was sitting there, not feeling too good, but not feeling that bad. So finally, I realized it was snowing, it was icy, 
all these things, and she was a little, so I just grew this. So I called 911. And 911 quickly answered, and they said, well, what do you got? And I said, well, I don't know, it's a stomachache. They said, stick some aspirin under your tongue. And I was like, really? That's a heart attack thing. I don't have a heart attack. But, you know, I more or less do what I'm told. <laughs> so I did, and uh, they dispatched a... Uh, ambulance who got there in very short order the uh, the people came in and, and they talked to me and, and they took you know some vitals here and there and they looked at me and they said well do you want to go to the hospital and I was like why well, yes I said what could this be and they said well you could be having a heart attack I said well all right if that's the case then let's go and they said well can you walk I said sure so I got up and I walked out and I got in the ambulance and they uh, uh, started to do their thing and they were chitting and chatting and everybody was talking and they put all kind of things on my chest and all of a sudden there was quiet and the uh, technicians uh, were saying okay do this do that and they put some um, things under my tongue and I the the attitude in the ambulance changed them dramatically when they started seeing something on a screen and so they pulled down the driveway and I think about halfway onto Butler Street I died my heart stopped that was it and for the rest of the night they struggled with me trying to bring me back they said that during the night I came and went three separate times and it was uh, sometime the next day that as I was waking up and they were pulling the vent out of my, my mouth, there was, <clears throat> and I haven't been able to actually explain to people what it was, whether it was a feeling or whether it was a voice, I don't know, but something said clearly, serve God. That's it. That's all it was said, serve God said it once, gone. And as I was laying there, coming out of the fog, coming out of what amounted to a total blackness, and I remember the blackness, which was pretty interesting too. So there I was in total blackness, and then I came out and I was uh, instructed to serve God. The doctor came in at some point later that morning and he looked at me and he looked at the chart and he looked at me and he looked at the chart and he said, with all that you've been through, there was no damage done to your heart. And I was kind of, at the time, you know, you're half foggy, the whole thing. I didn't really realize what all had happened to me. But there was a pastor whose name was Jim Bowes. He was a retired pastor. He lived in Slippery Rock, of all places. Somehow he had heard that I was in the hospital and had had this. He immediately felt the need to come. He jumped in his car and drove from Slippery Rock down to Passwin Hospital and came and laid hands on me and prayed with me. And I was stunned by that because he wasn't my pastor. He wasn't serving a church, but he said that he had felt called by God to come and be with me. I was absolutely blown away by the entire experience, as you may well guess. I spent a few days in the hospital. They put some, you know, metal pieces in me here and there, and I went home, and uh, here I am. So I was... I was very overwhelmed by this feeling, voice, whatever it was that said serve God. I couldn't talk to anybody about it. There was a number of weeks went by before I could actually even mention it to someone, including my own family. And I said I had had this, I finally, I was brought low by the, by the experience. And I, I, when I finally was able to talk to somebody about it, I was so overwhelmed that I just wept like crazy. And, and it was an, an amazing experience. And I still to this day am not 100% sure. Because as I was recovering from it and as I thought about it, I said, serve God. Oh, Lord, I've been moderator of Presbytery twice. 
I'm the chairman of the committee in ministry. I've gone through the CLP training. I do preach here and there in the third place. I, what, <laughs> what do you got? You know, what do you want? And I finally was talking to another pastor who said, you know, God placed a call upon your life and God in his good time will tell you what that call is all about. So I'm here today as I was in Jefferson Center, as I was in Westminster, to serve God. I am a Lazarus, as are you, as are each of you. Now, I've told this story a couple times over the years, and every time I've told it, someone has said to me afterwards, yes, I know, I too have had that experience. I too have known someone who has been moved by something that is beyond themselves in a way that brings them low and, and, and has encouraged them, and they too are not sure what to do with it. Now, some of us have had profound experiences. Some of us have had very quiet experiences. Some of us have seen the experience in some place else and now understand that it is possible that they too may have this experience. You, each of you, are a Lazarus. As you sit and you think about the story of, of Jesus rising him from the dead, he has in fact ra raised each of us from the dead. When you put yourself into this story in different places, whether you think you could be a Martha, whether you think you could have been one of the people standing off in the distance watching all of this take place, whether you could have been part of the Sanhedrin thinking to yourself, I don't know what this is all about. You are also a Lazarus. The question becomes, what are you going to do about it? You're a Lazarus. You've been given a second chance. You've been given life anew. And how do you, how do you intend to, to deal with that? It's an awesome, terrifying kind of place to be when you think to yourself, God has given me this chance. God has given me this opportunity. I don't know what I should be doing. Well, he has called each of you. He has given each of you a second chance. He has given each of you something great to celebrate. And he will give each of you the details. Know that he is with you. He is within you. He is leading you. He is guiding you. And he will strengthen you. So as Jesus has given you a second chance, he's also going to give you guidance on what you should be doing. Our challenge, of course, is to hear, to listen, to be attuned, to understand that the call may come at any minute, the directions may be clear, the directions may be a little hard to follow. You may say, I don't want to follow those directions. You know? I wake up on a Sunday morning when I'm preaching and I think to myself, Lord, why can't I just sleep in? No, this is not what he had in mind. He has something in mind for each of us and he'll tell each of you what he wants you to do. Hear the call. Answer the call. Take the second chance and do something with it. It's a great day in the neighborhood. It's a great day in the kingdom. In Christ's name, amen. What do you want to pray about? What's on your heart? We as a community of faith come together and we, we seek to be one in our prayer life together that he might hear us, that he may answer us, that he may be, there's a great line in one of the Psalms that said, he who gave us an ear will hear. 
He who gave us an eye will see. So he sees us and he hears us. As we gather together today, may our prayers go forth to him. What's on your heart? Uh, first, the praise. Getting three county fairs done in less than two weeks was a lot. We hit a lot of, we hit like three different states, and uh, that was a blessing. And now that we're back, Rose has a pretty bad tooth infection. So if I could have prayer for that, and I have some testing I'm going into the hospital for on Tuesday. So. What? Keep us in your prayers for all that we face, and keep Daisy in mind for um, all the homeschooling stuff and paperwork, and that I can get all the things done she needs done to move forward. Uh, I'd like prayers for my friend Kathy. Um, she fell and dislocated her shoulder. And her husband had died suddenly, not very, uh, a year ago. And uh, so she's alone, and it's a very difficult when you're right-handed and it's your right arm that you can't use. So she needs all of our prayers that she can get through this. Thank you. and for the children. I'll add a prayer request. They, people here in the congregation have heard it before, but our daughter, Amber, um, is not finding a, um, been through many doctors and had many uh, suggestions about what to do, and the condition continues to get worse. Um, they, they went, she went to the surgeon, and the surgeon said, well, I can't do it now because you've, we gave you too many medications, and it's complicated, and so we can't do anything right now. And she's hearing that, and she is, she is suffering a great deal. And I, I would ask you to please continue keeping her, that's Amber, in, in your prayers. Thank you. Together, let us approach God. Father, we come before you as a people filled with gratitude, filled with joy, filled with appreciation for all the many blessings that you have given us. We know, Father, that there are those times when we have uh, forgotten your love, perhaps wasted a gift, wandered from your ways, but we, uh, we as a people seek to be near you, seek to have you as a vital part of our lives. So Father, may we, may we continue to, to seek you and to find you everywhere. Our, our human failings are, are very obvious to you, but yet you still continue to to love us and to guide us and to strengthen us and to heal us. Father, we, we are a grateful people. Our joy is in knowing you. Our praise is for you. And we seek always to bring glory to your name. But Father, we know in our hearts there are things that are driving us away from you. There are things that seek to separate us from you. And we would ask, Father, that you would, you would wash those things away from us. That as we come with burdens heavy, that you may lift them. That we may be able to actually hand them to you, as opposed to trying to hold on to them. Help us, Father, to be lifted out of our sadness when it occurs, lifted out of our concerns, lifted away from our fears. May we be a joyful people 24-7.
Father, we do many times feel the warmth of your love, but there are those times when we are, when we are a little low, and those times seem to be driven by meh, the world that we see around us, the world that is so far from being under our control. And we, we tend to think that it is something that we should be able to do when in fact it's nothing that we can do. Father, we have dear ones who are hurting. We have friends that we know that are waiting for diagnoses or going for testing or trying to find the strength to put the one foot in front of the other, knowing, knowing as they know that God is calling them home. We pray, Father, that you will heal in all cases. We know, Father, that sometimes that healing is not necessarily a physical one, but a spiritual and emotional one. May you be there for each person who needs that healing. Father, in this time of school starting, we lift up to you all of our children who are about to return to school, perhaps for the first time, perhaps returning to a, a place of learning that isn't that far from home. It may, in fact, be at home. May they be able to focus on that learning experience. May they be able to gain knowledge that they might be better people in this world. So for the teachers, be with them, encourage them, strengthen them, guide them, help them to be wise beyond themselves. For the administrators, for the parents, all may they know your presence in their lives. Father, we bring before you our concerns for the people of Hawaii, the people of Southern California, the people of Plum, all who are suffering, all who have experienced catastrophe or are afraid of catastrophe occurring. May you be with each, may you strengthen. Where the winds might blow, may they blow not in a way that destroys but in a way that cleanses. May the rains be gentle. May they be empowering and, and feeding as opposed to devastating and washing. And Father, for the people of Hawaii that are still trying to wrap their heads around the destruction that has taken place, be with the first responders. Be with those people who are the helpers. Look for the helpers, is the great saying. And may they be many, and may they be strengthened by your presence in their lives. And Father, we know that there are places in this world where evil seems to be uh, in charge, where violence, where, where people just don't respect each other. May you, may you bring calm in those places. May you bring peace to the people that are seeking to be violent. And Father, there are those people whom we call troops, who we call the military, who put themselves between us and those who might do us harm. We'd ask, Father, that not only the military, but the, all the first responders, all of the police, all of the fire, all of those people who run to save and one to protect, may you be with each of them. May you bring all of them home at the end of the day, at the end of their deployment, at the end of their career, safe, both physically and emotionally. We thank you for their efforts and we thank you for, their, for your call upon their lives. The fall is approaching. And we know the seasons will be changing, but we know you changeth not. You were the same today as you were yesterday as you will be tomorrow. Glory be to God. And Father, as we, as a community of faith, boldly approach you, 
please hear us as we, as we pray the prayer that your Son has taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. I would invite you now to affirm your faith. And I'd also invite you to stand as you do it. So I have a question for you. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress, persecution or famine, or nakedness or peril or sword? We respond to the call upon our lives, and we respond in many ways. In many ways, God accepts our gifts, whether it be monetary, which we are about to receive, or whether it be through our ability to answer his call when he says, serve me. Today is a great day in the kingdom. As we receive this offering, our prayer is that, Father, that you would use this offering to bring glory to your name here in this place and beyond throughout your kingdom. It is in Christ's most holy name that we pray. Amen. forgot to turn on my mic, sorry. All right, our final hymn today is Softly and Tenderly. Please stand. Jesus said, Lazarus, come out, and he did. And when he came out, he was covered with the death cloths, and, they, and Jesus said, uncover him and let him go. Jesus had done his work by letting Lazarus come forth 
and he challenged the people around him to help by taking off all of those clothes so that Lazarus could go forth and serve. We don't know a whole lot about what Lazarus did after that. There's not a whole lot in scripture that describes him as being an evangelist or, or going forth and, and saying, you know, this is, I'm alive because of Jesus. Some people have said that he was there when Jesus was crucified. Other people have said that as he was brought back from the dead, he then had a bullseye on his chest because the Sanhedrin was like, he is an example of Jesus' work. If we can but kill him, we'll show Jesus. So they thought perhaps the idea was to do away with Lazarus. We don't know. But he lived anew. He had a second chance, as do each of us. So as we go forth from this place, may we know that we walk with his encouragement and his renewed faith in us. May we do something with that. May we bring glory to his name in this place in some way, shape, or form throughout the kingdom of God. I would charge you now to go out into the world with courage, to hold on to all that is good, to return no one evil for evil, to support the faint-hearted, to help the suffering, to honor all people, and to rejoice in the power and in the presence of the Holy Spirit that is within your life. And now may the grace and the peace and the love of the one triune God, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit descend upon us and abide within us now and forevermore. Amen. And amen.